All right, friends, let me ask you a question. Is it possible for a Christian, a born again believer in Jesus Christ, to be hard hearted? You know, a lot of times when we think about hard heartedness, we usually think of somebody who is an unbeliever and somebody who's staunch in their unbelief, somebody who refuses to move or budge and they they look like that they'll never repent or anything like that. We think that those people are hard of heart. And that's true. They are. And even if we were to apply that term to encompass the Christian, we might think of somebody who is engaged in a certain sin and is unrepentant and fails to see the error of his or her way or whatever like that. But, you know, the whole thing about hard heartedness, yes, I believe that there is such a thing as a Christian who is hard of heart. And I think we see an example of that in the lives of Jesus's disciples. And that's what we're going to look at today. But it's going to look a little bit different. It's, it's not going to look like what you might think in your mind just as it relates to hard hearted, hard heartedness. So what does that look like? Well, that's what we're going to explore today. And what I want to do is I want to I want to share with you a sermon that I preached um, on this. Um, it was entitled Beware of Hard Heartedness. And so it it. it covers a range of passages dealing with the uh, dealing with Jesus's disciples that tends to demonstrate how they themselves Jesus's 12 followers how they were hard of heart how they were guilty of being hard of heart I'm going to show and I'm going to demonstrate how that is or what that and what that looks like so this sermon I preached um, actually a, around or almost around this time of year three years ago so we're talking about fall of 2017 i think it may have been in late october i think um, of 2017 so it was a few years ago but um, i want to go ahead and share this with you and uh, i hope that this really uh, speaks a word to you um, and uh, that uh, it gives you something to think about and asking yourself am i somebody who's, who's susceptible to hardness of heart just like the disciples were Okay, so I really hope that this this you know really turns the gears in your mind to really just kind of think about your own heart and your own spirit. Ask the Lord and the Holy Spirit to guide you in that thought as well, and I think that uh, something profitable will come from this. Okay, so we'll go ahead and explore this sermon, um, and uh, that's going to be the content of our episode today. On this side, I just want to say that if you enjoy loving the scriptures, uh, if you haven't done so already and you intend to, um, I would strongly, strongly encourage you to subscribe to my show on Apple Podcasts, also on um, iHeartRadio and YouTube. You can also follow Loving the Scriptures on Twitter. The handle is at LT Scripts. That's L T S C R I P T S, which stands for Loving the Scriptures. All right. So um, I will go ahead and transition you into the sermon. My name is Steve Gill, and you're listening to Loving the Scriptures. something a little bit different um, because we are um, instead of focusing on one specific text like we usually do I'm gonna we're gonna look at a series of texts but it's all connected together from one theme for, from a, a series of episodes in the lives of the disciples with the with uh, with Jesus and how we observe how the how the how the disciples suffered from hard-heartedness so if you Notice the title there, Beware of Hard-Heartedness. You might think that we, we, we talk about hard-heartedness and we're going to be talking about the disciples. And maybe, I don't know, I can't get in everybody's minds, but maybe you're thinking, how do those two things go together? Because if you're anything like me, you might think hard-heartedness and you might think of somebody who is an unbeliever somebody who is rebellious, somebody who just doesn't want to have anything to do with, with the things of God. And for the most part, when we look at Scripture, when we look at the Bible, that's absolutely true. Um, and it's interesting, I was just thinking about this because I just got done, um, I just got done recording um, an episode for my podcast, which is going to be uploaded, I think, next week. Um, 
and I entitled it The Barrier of Hard-Heartedness. This is all in the, in the study of Acts that I'm doing um, as part of that. And um, just in the discussion of, of what I was talking about in hard-heartedness, because we were looking at the Sadducees when they were, uh, when they were confronting Peter and John after they had healed the, uh, the lame beggar in the temple. And just when you really examine Scripture, it's amazing it's amazing just the level of hard-heartedness, the stubbornness that these unbelieving Jews had about Jesus Christ and about these apostles who were preaching about Christ and they were preaching the resurrection of the dead. So when we think about hard-heartedness, we usually think along those lines. At least I do anyway. So when we're talking about the disciples, what are we talking about when it comes to hard-heartedness? Are we just talking about, are, are we saying that the disciples, or am I saying, because we're going to look at this together, I'm going to present some things, am I saying that the disciples had, the, had that level of hard-heartedness where they were rebellious, where they were stubborn, where they were actively against Christ? Well, if we understand Scripture, obviously I think you'd know that the answer to that question is no, but that doesn't take away from the fact that there was... Uh, there was a, a certain level of hard-heartedness that, this, that the disciples did suffer from. And I think that that's very important for us to recognize because if it happened with the disciples, it can happen with us as well. And we want to be careful of that. And we want to be, and we want to be aware of that. So when it comes to talking about the disciples, um, let me just throw out this warning because... Um, we, we can tend to do a couple of things when it, when it comes to our observation of the disciples. Number one, when we look at the disciples, we look, because we look at the disciples and a lot of times we see them in a not so good light and we kind of think, wow, what a, what a bunch of goofballs. Um, why are they so slow in getting it, you know? And that certainly is true. So the, the disciples really were a slow bunch from time to time. But sometimes I think we get so used to that mindset that we that we actually ignore or overlook some of the good moments that the disciples had on the other hand on the other side we have to be careful because when we look at the disciples and we think and we look at those areas where they're kind of acting a little dim-witted um, we look at them and we say wow look at those look at those nitwits why didn't they get it and then we we say those things and we think those things without examining our own hearts because I think if we're really honest with ourselves, when we look at the disciples, sometimes if we really examine ourselves, when we allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us, we realize that sometimes we're not all too different from them. And we think along the same lines. Now, along those two thoughts, we are going to see some good in the disciples, okay? Along with their bad. Now, admittedly, the bad that we're going to see in the disciples far outweighs the good, but we do want to acknowledge the good, okay? And we're going to, um, as, we, as we examine this, we want to ask the question, are we like this? Or do we suffer? Do we suffer with bouts of hard-heartedness just like the disciples did? So those are the things that we want to think about as we examine Scripture this morning. And we're going to do it, um, we're going to start off um, this, kick this whole thing off by looking at a very significant miracle that Jesus performed um, among a multitude of people. So if you have a Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 14. That's where we're going to start. We're going to start off in Matthew, but we're going to eventually flip over to Mark um, and finish the rest of our, rest of our message um, in the book of Mark. But, um, and I could have easily uh, looked at the Gospel of Mark um, for this account that we're going to look at here, but there's just one or two very minor details that Matthew includes that Mark doesn't that I just want to, uh, that I just wanted to, uh, to point out. So in Mark chapter 14, um, and starting in verse 13 and following, um, and we don't have to read the entire passage, um, but if you look at that section of Scripture in verses 13 through 21, what we have is the story of the miracle that Jesus performed in feeding the 5,000, uh, feeding the crowd of 5,000. So many of us are familiar with the story, right? You have, uh, it, and how it starts out is that there are a lot of, there are, you know, obviously 5,000 people. And it's, it's interesting, originally how this came about, Jesus was trying to get away with his disciples, kind of to have some alone time with them because they've been busy ministering and, 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 and touching lives and speaking the truth to all sorts of people. And Jesus says, let's get away. 
And so they try and get away, and then when they get to the destination where they're trying to go, here comes this large group of people from all the surrounding towns wanting to see Jesus, wanting to interact with him. And um, it says that Jesus received them because they were, like sheep, they were like sheep without a shepherd. So here you have a great multitude of people. Jesus heals some of them who are suffering from illnesses and diseases. And so you get this idea that this is kind of an all-day affair. They, they spend a great, a great amount of time with, with this group of people. Now you can imagine that, um, that interacting with, with, with that great amount of people is pretty exhausting, You're getting near the end of the day. And so when it comes to this point, when it's, when it's time for this, this gathering, this assembly to come to an end, the disciples come to, come to Jesus and if you look at verse 15, this is, what it, this is what it says here. It says in verse 15, again, we're in Matthew 14. And it says, now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and the day is, is now over. And the, cra- and, the, uh, it, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. So when, I, when you look at that, that's not really altogether an unreasonable request. I mean, you just, have, you just have the disciples coming up and saying, look, this is the situation, and we realize that these people need, to, need something to eat, so let's just send them away. It's getting towards the end of the day anyway. It's, it's just a very reasonable request. Can't fault them for saying that. But look at what Jesus says in verse 16. But Jesus said, they need not go away you give them something to eat. They said to him, we have only five loaves here and two fish. Now, let me pause for a minute and say that this is one area where the disciples tend to get a hard time. The temptation is, is that when we look at this and we see the the disciples' reaction, their response to what Jesus says, and I've even read this in a few commentaries here and there over the years, where, the, where they say, well, why didn't the disciples just turn to Jesus and say, why don't you just provide food? It's within your power to do so. And so the disciples are kind of, uh, they're kind of blamed for, for not having the insight to do that. And, that's when, and this is one of those situations where we overlook the good in the disciples and automatically say, oh, those, those dim-witted disciples, why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do that? Now, when you compare, I think it's in, it's in John's, uh, 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 John's account, in John chapter 6, um, the way that the story goes is that, is that Jesus uh, asks Philip specifically, how are we going to feed all these people? And it says, and John says in the narration that he said this to test him. So we understand when we, when we put some of these different accounts together, we see that Jesus is really, is really bringing a test on these people, okay? And we have to understand, this is something that Jesus says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to feed these people. I want you. Now put yourself in their sandals. And I understand this illustration isn't the most perfect in the world because given technology and things like that, this, I mean, this might be a little bit easier, but... Um, but think in your minds with me, if you're in a situation where on a Husker Saturday and you have Memorial Stadium packed to the gills like it usually is, um, 90 plus thousand people, and you are given the specific task, you are, this is your responsibility, um, and, and let's, let's assume all the, all the concession stands are shut down, uh, nobody has any food, nobody has any money, it's just... There's no food anywhere. I know that's not realistic, but just just stay with me on this. 90 plus thousand people, and they say, you give them something to eat. Provide food for all of these people. I mean, you you don't even have to think about that along the lines of Memorial Stadium. I mean, if if I was told, if Mark said, hey, I want you to feed everybody in the congregation, and you can't use your phone, you can't order anything, I'm going to lock those doors... And I want you to feed these people. And be like, what? I, I mean, it's not like you, anybody can pull a sandwich out of their pocket, because I don't know people who carry sandwiches in their pockets and say, 
kind of D. <laughs> okay, one person does. Um, <laughs> but even if that's not an option, somebody might pull out some Tic Tacs and say, this is the best I can do. I can share these. <laughs> but it's not going to do much for sustenance. So we're put in a very, I, I, I would be put in a very helpless situation in being given the task to, to, to feed people, and I, don't, and I don't have the resources. Check this out. I don't have the resources. That's the point. So when, so when the disciples say, um, what did they say here in, in this account? Um, they say um, in verse 17, we have only five loaves here and two fish. So in other words, they see the mass of people. They say, we, this is all we have. And in, uh, in Mark's account, um, they say 200 denarii worth of food wouldn't be enough to, to give these people just a little bit, just even a morsel. Now, a denarii was, was, a, a denarius was, the, was one day's wage for the common laborer. So 200 denarii, that's pretty expensive. So they understand that they don't have the resources, but you know what? That's the point. Now, we said that this is a test. Jesus is testing them to see what they're going to do. Now, if you ask me, did the disciples pass or fail the test? I'm going to say, maybe you'll disagree with me, but I'm going to say that they passed with flying colors. I think Jesus' point was for them to say, I can't. I, I can't. That's the whole point. And it's beautiful what you see here. Um, after, after, they said, after they just present Jesus with, look, this is all we have, five, five loaves of bread and two fish. In verse, eight, in, uh, in verse 18, it says, and he said, bring them here to me. You see the transition? Now that, now, that, now that Jesus has them where he wants them, now that they've acknowledged I'm in a position where I can't, I just don't have the resources, Jesus says, well, bring, bring what you have, bring it here to me, and you're going to see what I'm able to do. Have you ever had that happen where you're, where you're and I can certainly attest to this in my life, um, and I won't go into the story because I'm supposed to keep this short, kind of. <laughs> but have you ever been in a situation where things are just going on in your life and you are just backed into a corner, just situationally in life? Now, I can, I can say for myself, in situations here and there, where life just seems to be closing in around me, I can look back on those times and I know for certain that God was deliberately, deliberately backing me into that corner. Why? Because he's mean? Because he's not a nice God? No. I look back and I, and, I, and I was at a point where I said, Lord, I can't. Or Lord, I don't know. I, I don't know how to do this. Can you, can you help me? And then when I was at that point where I said, Lord, I can't, then, Jesus, then, then the Lord said, now you're going to be able to see what I can do and see him work in amazing ways. I think that's what, that's, that's what you have going on there. So we know the rest of the story. The, they, they bring the five loaves and the two fish. He blesses them. He divides them up, and, and they distribute it with, uh, among 5,000 people. 5,000 men, by the way. That's not including women and children. So there's, as far as individuals there, there's more than 5,000 people. But, I mean, we just, we just have that number in our mind, 5,000, whether it's just men or whatever, that's a lot of people. Now, it's, it's amazing that the disciples got to participate in that event. You just kind of wonder what it was like because the, you just have five loaves and two fish and they just are distributing with the, these groups of people and they're able to witness you know, just kind of the creative miracle that was happening as they're, as they're distributing this food. Once they get to the end of the basket, somehow there's more, somehow there's more, somehow there's more, and they keep passing it out and passing it out. Now, we also understand from the story, if you're familiar with Scripture, we understand that there were leftovers. Well, there's, there's two things that we understand. Number one, if you look in verse 20, it says, and they all ate and were satisfied. So everybody got their fill. They walked away with full stomachs. And they took up 12 baskets, baskets full of broken pieces left over. And folks, that wasn't an accident. I believe that had Jesus wanted to, Jesus would have had the divine power and the divine know-how to come up with the exact number of bread and fish 
that everybody needed to have to have their fill and be satisfied with nothing left over. I think he, he could have done that. And we think, well, if not that situation and we have leftovers, maybe we think maybe a few baskets, maybe a couple, but 12? 12 basketfuls of, of, of broken pieces that are left over. Now, that's not a, that's not a whoops. That's not a whoops. I, I kind of, have, you ever, have you ever cooked something and then you realize that you cooked more than you needed? And he's like, whoops, I, 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 I put in five cups of rice and I only needed two. That's not what we're dealing with here. This wasn't something where, where Jesus said, I, I just got carried away. I didn't mean to, to, do, to, to create this much. I was supposed to say something, and that's going to be an important piece to our story as we, as we go along here. But 12 basketfuls of, of broken pieces left over that were there after everybody was satisfied. Okay, so you get the picture. So, that's, that's the first scene. We kind of look at this as a play, and that's, we just looked at scene one, okay? Very incredible miracle. The disciples got to participate in it. They were tested by Jesus. By Jesus. Jesus is saying, what, what are we going to do, essentially? And they, and the, you know, or he says, you give them something to eat. He gives them an impossible task deliberately. They say, I can't. And he says, good, now bring them here to me. He performs this wonderful miracle. Everybody's satisfied, and they have 12 basketfuls of of broken pieces left over. So a wonderful scene. Scene two, uh, flip over to to Mark chapter chapter 6. And in verse, verse 45, well, the story starts in verse 45. And goes all the way to verse 52. And I'll just, and I'll go ahead and I'll read this, read this whole account. And this is, and this is uh, another familiar account um, with, uh, with the account of Jesus walking on water. And the reason why I come to Mark here, because Matthew focuses more on, um, on the situation during that time when, when Peter got out and walked on the water with Jesus and started to sink. That was kind of Matthew's focus. Um, and while that there's a lot of lessons to be learned from that. That's not where we want to go this morning. So I just want to focus on, um, on this passage here in Mark and what he says at the very end of this passage. And this is where we get to the whole hard-heartedness thing. Because when you look at, at, uh, at verse 45, let's, look, let's read the account here and what it says. And so in, in, Mar- in, this, in this account in Mark, this is right after uh, Mark's account of the, of the feeding of the, of the 5,000. And it says in verse 45, immediately he made his disciples get into a boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up to the, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making, that they were making headway painfully for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to, he meant to pass by them, but when, he, when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost. And he cried out, and they cried out, and they cried out for, all, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded. Now here's, here's the clincher, verse 52. For they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. So there's, there's, there's where we get it from Scripture itself. The disciples experiencing a sense of hard-heartedness. And it's connected to this whole thing of being utterly amazed at what happened. Now, in some sense, you want to cut the disciples a little bit of slack because when's the last time you saw somebody walking on water? I mean, I've never seen that before. I mean, you see Jesus walking on top of the water. I, I, saw, I saw a shirt years ago. It's kind of funny. It's in, it, said, it said Jesus didn't need a surfboard, which I thought was pretty cool. But, you know, you have, you have him walking on water, and they thought that he was a ghost. And, he, and when he, he gets in on the boat, it, the, you know, the wind, the, you know, everything ceases. And so they're, they're just out of their minds. Now, here's the thing as it relates to their hard-heartedness, and I think this is where we can get into a little bit of, um, a little bit of the problem that the the disciples are are suffering from, just as far as their hard-heartedness. The way that we should understand this whole thing of of them being 
totally astounded is that they're still grappling with this whole thing of, of how, is this, how is this even possible? And so when they're looking at everything happening around them with this situation in particular, they're having trouble receiving in their hearts and their minds that they're not dealing with any old ordinary person. It's just, it's just a barrier within their spirit where they're just, they're just having a hard time receiving these things. Now, again, this hard-heartedness isn't, isn't, isn't being expressed by hostili- like hostility like a lot of Jesus' enemies, but it is hard-heartedness nonetheless of one degree or another. And so when it's talking about this hard-heartedness, they're, they're having trouble receiving these things. And so that, to me, indicates that they're having trouble wrapping their arms and their minds around this whole thing, that they're dealing with somebody totally other. And, the, and you, it, it's really amazing when you think about, up to this point, some of the things from the beginning of Jesus' ministry up until that point that the disciples have actually witnessed Jesus do. They've already seen him, for example, drive out demons. He's done that twice. And one of those guys had a legion of demons. He had so many demons in him. So they've seen, it. They've seen him do that. They've seen him heal a leper. They've seen him heal a paralytic. They saw him heal a man with a withered hand. They saw him raise a widow's son from the dead. So they've actually seen a, a case of, of, of resurrection. You know, I think if, if we were to rank the, amaz- uh, the amazingness of any sort of miracles from a human perspective, I would think that maybe raising somebody from the dead would be on the top of the list. So they were able to see that. They, saw, they, they witnessed Jesus calm the storm. They thought they were going to die. The waves were overwhelming the boat. And they even came to Jesus and said, don't you care that, with that, that we're going to die? And Jesus just gets up. And he says, peace, be still all over. And they were amazed at that. And some of them got to see uh, Jesus raise Jairus' daughter from the dead. So you got a good handful of things that, that they've been able to see. But when you have this whole thing with, the, with, the, uh, with Jesus walking on the water, there's just something about that in addition to everything else where it's just like, we, there's just something. We, we, there's, spiritually, there's something going on in there where they're just having trouble accepting this, this whole idea of who they're dealing with. And, it, and so every time they see these things, it throws them for a loop. Now, that hard-heartedness and the expression of that hard-heartedness, this is, just, this is just descriptive here. This is just Mark describing, hey, their hearts were hard. But we're going to see how it manifests itself as our story goes on. Okay? So that's scene two. It's a very brief scene, but it's a very important scene to help us have a little bit more of an understanding of what we see following this. Okay? And what we see following scene three is another miracle. Now, guess what? This is a miracle that is almost identical to what we just saw before. Because in Mark chapter 8, verse 1 through 10, we see the feeding of the 4,000. Now, really, like I said, this is almost exact. The only difference that you really see is that there's just a different number of people. There's less number of people. I mean, sure, it's only a thousand less, and you still have a lot of people for a thousand. But I mean, we're, we're, the truth of the matter is, we're, deal, we're dealing with less people. And so, as you go into the story, it says in Mark chapter eight, verse one, it says, "In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now for three days.'" And have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from, uh, have come from far away. So another small difference here we, we see in this account is that whereas the disciples say, hey, let's send the people away so that they, get, they can get something to eat. Here Jesus kind of makes the initiation here. Now this sort of has a hint of testing in it too, I believe. Now scripture doesn't explicitly say it in this account like it did before. Um, in the first miracle in John chapter 6. But you kind of get this idea because it's just the perfect setup. Like I said, the situation is just pretty much the same. And so Jesus, and and you notice the way Jesus describes it. It's almost as if he's, he's closing all of these options and saying, well, we can't send them away, 
because it's too far away and they might faint on the way. You know, you're just kind of laying these things out. You know, in, uh, in other words, just saying we need to, we need to figure out a way to, to get these people something to eat. Now, if this is another testing, which I think it is, remember the first time I, th- I believe that they passed with flying colors because they understood the lack of their resources and they rightly said, we can't. We don't have the resources to do that. Now we have the same situation. And look at their, look at their response in verse 4. And his disciples answered him, how can one feed these people with bread here in, the, in this desolate place? Wait, what? <laughs> what I, you know, sometimes it just boggles the mind where you, where you look at that and you see, you know, again, I'm going to repeat it again. This is the same situation. The only difference is that there's less people. And the impression that you get, I don't know exactly how much time passed between these two accounts, but you get the impression that not a lot of time passed. And so they've just seen something like this before, and now they're in the same situation. And they say, well, we don't, you know, what's going to happen? They, they didn't turn and they didn't say, well, remember, we remember what, what happened last time. Lord, if we, just, if we just scrounge up whatever we can, do you think you can do something with that? Do you think that you can take that and do what you did before? But they didn't do that. They were at oh, the same amount of loss that they were before. And so if we were to ask the question, did the disciples pass or fail this test? They got a big fat F on this one. They got a big fat F. Now here's the thing, because what boggles the mind, at least what boggles my mind, is, is the, again, this is the grandness of, of the miracle that they, had, that they had seen before and how fresh that would have been on their, on their minds. Now, in fairness to the disciples, the disciples are not the only people to be forgetful like that after something that happened that was so wondrous. You see, you see examples of that with the, with the Israelites in, in the Bible. If you read through the Old Testament and you see all the things that God did for them while they were in the wilderness, um, and then you still have them questioning God's goodness, you know, as they're, as they're journeying towards the promised land, you think, what in the world is going on? Why are, why are they like this? But I think that's important for us to note in our minds, and this is where we have to stop and we have to, we have to examine our own, our own hearts or let the Holy Spirit examine it and bring to mind things that might be deficient in our own hearts and our own spirits. Because isn't it amazing that you have examples in the Bible where even after the greatest displays of God's power, people forget. And we look at that in Scripture and we say, how stupid, and it, we don't deny that it is, but that if you see that happening with more than one group of people, I think that that's something that's common among humanity, which includes you and me. Have you ever had it where God worked in amazing ways in your life, and then a week later you forgot about, you totally forgot about it? And then when you're in a similar situation or some other situation that's maybe even less dire, we go, oh no, woe is me, what are we going to do? And God's like, I, but I just worked so powerfully here. And that's the thing that we have to guard against. We're forgetful people. I want to talk about that a little bit later. But we see this specifically with the disciples. When we talk about hard-heartedness, here's the manifestation of it. Because they don't recognize that, that with Jesus in their midst and understanding what Jesus did before, they can, say, they can even still acknowledge what they said before and say, we don't have the resources to do that. But Lord, we know you are able. We've seen you work before and appeal to him in that way. But they're just, they're just as much of a loss now as they were before. So Jesus says, ask them, um, in verse 5, how many, how many loaves do you have? And they said seven. And so as the story goes on, we don't have to read the whole story, but we're familiar with it again, right? So they have seven loaves and a few fish, and Jesus did, does the exact same thing there that he did before. And he feeds 4,000 people. And you have the same situation where you have an abundance. This time there's seven baskets, baskets full of, of, of broken pieces that are left over. So again, there's an abundance. Okay, so we see... Pretty much the same situation, the same miracle happened, same abundance, end of the story, right? And so we think, okay, the, the story ends there. Maybe now, maybe now the, the, the disciples have learned. Maybe now they got it. I wish that were the case. I wish, I wish, but that it didn't turn out that way. <laughs> 
So now we come to scene four. Here's the pinnacle here. And it comes right after here. We're still in Mark. And in verse, if you look at verse 11, it says, The Pharisees came and began to argue with him. Now, well, let, me, let me back up. Because uh, they, uh, in verse 10, so he, he did the miracle. And then in verse 10, it says, And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. Okay, so the impression you get when you get to verse 11 is that when they get there, they get challenged by the, by the Pharisees. So it says, the Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his, uh, in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, it left them, got into the boat again and went to the other side. Now, just understand that that, those few, those few verses is a setup for what we're going to see with the disciples. And this, and this is, it, this is a setup for the unfortunate thing we're going to see with, with the disciples here. Um, this whole thing, because I have to, because I'm looking at my Bible here and I don't know if anybody has the same version as me or if this, if you're looking at a different version, if it does the same thing here, where those verses, verses 11 through 13, are, are, are the, the heading is the Pharisees demand a sign as if that's a story in itself. Um, and then in verse 14 and following, it has another, it has another uh, um, heading. It says the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod. This is one of the disadvantages. Like, headings are, are helpful, but they, they're also dis, uh, they're, they also serve as a disadvantage too. I don't like how this is set up in my Bible as if we're dealing with two separate stories here. This is just a, what happened there in verses 11, uh, 12, and 13 is just a setup for what we're going to see with the disciples. It's all one, the one same story. So keep in mind what we've just seen in those, in those few verses here. Jesus has an encounter with the Pharisees. And remember last time I uh, preached to you, what was it, maybe a month ago, how I said how the Pharisees are just annoying people because they just pop up everywhere. And they, 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 they just, their, their sole purpose in life is to do Jesus in. Now, if you notice here what their request is, their request is to see a sign from heaven. Now, just like the disciples, the Pharisees are not, are not strangers to situations in Jesus' ministry where they've seen Jesus do amazing things. They've been around and they've seen, for example, they, they, some of the Pharisees were around to see Jesus heal, heal the paralytic. They were, also, they were also there around to see Jesus heal the man with the withered hand, you know, and they, they were people who didn't necessarily deny that something divine had happened. They knew very well what was going on. So you have these Pharisees who have seen these things, and now they come and they say, hey, why don't you show us a sign from heaven? Now, the idea of a sign from heaven is that, they're, they're, you know, why don't you do something more? We want, to, we want to see you do something. Like if you can do something with the sun or the moon or the stars, if you can do some sort of... Uh, you know, explosions and glitter of something so that we can really get wowed by something here. You kind of you get the sense, because we think, again, hard-heartedness, we know that the Pharisees and the elders and the scribes and everybody like that, they were definitely hard-hearted. And there's a manifestation of it right here. And they're saying, you know, show us more. We need to, we need to see more. And that's, what, and that's where Jesus says uh, that he refuses, and he says that a, a, a wicked and adulterous generation uh, well, he doesn't say it in this uh, passage here in Mark, but in, in a, a parallel passage, he says that a, a, wicked, um, a wicked generation, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign. So, they, so Jesus understood exactly what they were trying to do. And it says here, um, I believe, yes, in verse 11, it says that um, when they were asking him for the sign, they did it to test him. Now, we know that when we read through the Gospels, you know, testing from the Pharisees toward Jesus is nothing good. They do this with the purpose of trying to trap Jesus in some way. Okay, so here we, here we see the, uh, the Pharisees, the known enemies of Christ, when you read through the Gospels. Whenever they appear, we want to boo and we want to hiss. And so they, they have their little encounter with Jesus, and then Jesus gets into the boat, and he goes away. Now, he's in friendly territory. He's on the boat with his disciples, and when we pick up the story in verse 14, this is what you get. So it says in verse 14, now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they had, and, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat, 
And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the, le- and the leaven of Herod. So, I mean, Jesus is trying to, and this is a good thing about Jesus with, as, as a teacher of the disciples, because you get the sense that the disciples were there witnessing everything that had happened with the Pharisees. Jesus is saying, based on what you just saw there, I want to give you a warning. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of that of Herod. He's trying to teach them something. And there's a problem. They forgot bread. They forgot to bring lunch. And all they have is, is one loaf. Now, what does that sound like? That sounds like a lack of resources, right? Just like before. Just like with the, with the 5,000, just like with the 4,000. So they forgot to bring bread, and they only had one loaf. And so here you have Jesus trying to teach them this lesson that has nothing to do with literal physical bread, but that's what the disciples thought he was talking about. So when you look at verse 16, he says, And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. They thought, they thought that's what he was referring to. Maybe they thought in some way that that was Jesus' way of scolding them. You know, how could you forget to bring bread? Now, I don't know how they, how, if that's truly what their thinking was, I don't know how they came to that conclusion, given the fact that Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. You know, it, the, the two, the connections just don't seem to match up, but that's what's on the disciples' thinking. So their thinking is that Jesus is saying this because they have no bread. And so when you look at verse 17, it says, and Jesus, aware of this, said to them, and you can imagine that Jesus is just exasperated at this point. Because Jesus isn't even trying to test them. Remember, we see he's testing them these, those, those couple of times. This isn't even a test. Jesus is just trying to teach them a lesson that's different, that has nothing to do with physical bread. And he says, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Now, here he's going to ask these series of questions, and these are interesting questions, but notice them here. He says, do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? Now, I like how Mark presents this here because he gets them to participate, you know, so that they can kind of maybe see a little bit. He asks them a question, you, you give the answer. How many basketfuls of pieces did you, uh, did you pick up here? Well, in this case, with the 5,000, it was 12. In this case, it was 7. So, you know, Jesus kind of gets them to participate, probably hoping that, that, they, that, they, that they get it. Now, in Matthew's account, at the end of Matthew's account of this year, it says that the disciples then understood that he was talking about being oh, be aware of the teachings of the Pharisees um, and of Herod. So they got that portion of it, you know, at least according to Matthew. But here we, we, we notice a, a, a few things here. Now, this is... This is where, when we really look at this text, this is really where things just boggle our minds. Because again, what we've dealt with with is a situation with 5,000 people, 4,000 people. Now what are we dealing with? We're dealing with 13 people. 12 disciples plus Jesus. One loaf of bread, lack of resources. That's that's not going to be enough to go around probably, at least for people to have their fill. Now, the disciples are worried that Jesus is referring about physical bread because they forgot bread. So the idea that that you get when Jesus is bringing this out is that if I was really concerned about physical bread, don't you think that I would have been able to do what I did with the 5,000 and the 4,000? Now, notice that that he focuses more on the abundance that he created after, you know, everybody had their fill and was satisfied. That was, that was, the, that was the focus that, that, that he seemed to major on. So he said, when I, when, when I had the, the 5,000 people with the five loaves, how many, how many basketfuls did you pick up? Twelve. Well, with the 4,000, how many did you have? The seven basketfuls of, of, of broken pieces left over. And so what we see here is that you notice that Jesus was able to feed more people with less resources, with the larger group, with 5,000, there were less resources. They only had five loaves and, and two fish. 
Whereas with the lesser crowd, with 4,000, they had a little bit more. So Jesus was able to, was able to, uh, was able to create and then some with a greater crowd, a, a greater crowd with less resources. And he was able to create more of an abundance for the greater need, the 5,000, than he did with the, for the 4,000. I mean, in either case, it was, it was pretty amazing that the abundance that was left over. But I think one of the things that you see is that he did with, with the larger crowd, he had less resources and was able to give everybody their fill. And he, had, he created more of an abundance. There was 12 basketfuls left over as opposed to the seven that was before. Now line all that up together and you have a boat of 13 people. And the disciples are worried about, about bread. Jesus is like, no, 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 no. I could, I could easily take this one loaf and if I wanted to, I could, I could do the same thing that I did with the 5,000 people. Surely you think, surely you think that I, could, that I could provide for 13 people. There's the hard-heartedness manifested at work. Now, I want to go back to those, to those uh, beginning part of those series of questions. And this is really going to hone into the whole thing of, of, of the hard-heartedness. Because again, Hard-heartedness, a lot of time we think of the Pharisees, we think of the Sadducees and those sorts of people. And those are the, t- those are the people that Jesus got, just got done interacting with before he got on the boat. And it's significant that he uses this language after having, after having that encounter that he had with the Pharisees. So he says, go back to, go back to verse 17 where he says, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having no eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? Now, with that in mind, I want to show you something real quick in Matthew chapter 13. In in Matthew chapter 13, this is right after... Right after Jesus tells the story, the parable of the, of the sower, or the parable of the soils, whatever you call it, it's called both. And, um, and in verse 10 of Matthew chapter 13, it says this. It says, Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, you know, people on the outside, but to to them it has has not been given. For For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes, and, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. So you see the description that Jesus, so Jesus gives a description and then he pulls from scripture, he pulls from Isaiah, talking about having ears, but not being able to hear, their hearing has become dull, they're not being able to see. He says, so, you know, this language is, is used to describe people who, who don't believe. And that's one of the reasons why he gave parables uh, is, you know, is because they didn't believe and parables were a way of kind of hiding things a little bit more. But he's saying, but all of this is, is a, in a collective sort of way is just to, is to highlight the, the, the hard heartedness of a lot of the people that were on the outside, which the Pharisees were, were part of that group. Now, again, when we think about, when we think about what we see in Mark, when we see that Jesus has had that encounter with the Pharisees, they're expressing their hard heartedness. That's nothing new. We're not surprised by that anyway. And then we see the disciples, and they go through their whole thing. They misunderstand Jesus about what he's saying about bread. And then Jesus says that. He says, do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear, and do you not remember? In other words, if we want to put that in simple form, he's kind of like he's asking, are you like those Pharisees over there? <laughs> 
is that who is that is that who you're like is that is that is that you sure looks like it now that's that's kind of tough when we because again we think about the disciples and again we we the the, the comparison isn't exact you don't think the disciples are hostile towards Christ they're not hostile towards the things of God but but again to one degree or another you see hard heartedness come forth in a, in the same fashion that you see with the Pharisees and that's something that you know if the, if the if the disciples really clung to what Jesus was saying there hopefully they would come to the point where they th- where they think man we that we need to correct that I mean just imagine put yourself in their shoes and we understand that the Pharisees were again trying to do Jesus in and if somebody says and somebody says to us I, I think that that the way that you're they're, you're caring about your life you're living and thinking like a Pharisee. We wouldn't take that as a compliment. You, are, you, are you starting to think and act like a Pharisee? We might think, oh goodness, I hope not. I hope not. Now, as I kind of wrap this up, you know, we, we, can, kind of, we can kind of think, of, ask two questions in our minds. Because again, we, we want to we bring this home to us we want to also want to think about, about what, what, it, what it was specifically that, that, that the, were going on with the disciples that really contributed to this hard-heartedness. And does that speak to us today in some way, in some form? So a couple of questions to keep in your mind. To consider, and they're not deep questions, they're not deeply theological or deeply philosophical, but question number one would be, do we know who God is? Do we know who God... I think one of, the, one of the problems with the disciples is that, again, they were having trouble grappling with who they're dealing with. And they constantly saw things from a human plane, even though they were interacting with deity standing right next to them. They, they, had, they, had, the, they had the wonderment, and they had the thought in their mind, who is this? Remember the story when, the, when, the, when he calmed the storm? Remember what their question was? Who is this? That was their question. Who is this? That the wind and the waves obey him. They were still grappling with these, with these things. And I think in some way, we have to ask ourselves this question. Do we know who God is? And in that question, we have, the reason why we, it's important for us to ask that question is that we have to ask ourselves, do we, do we truly understand who we're dealing with? Because the problem is, in a lot of cases, a lot of times, we try and make God like us. We, try, we, we, we think that God thinks the exact same way that we do. We think that God does the exact same things that we do. And then when, it doesn't, when God doesn't work from the human script, we say, what is God doing? What's going on? Why is he doing this? Why is he doing that? And then sometimes, sinfully, we charge God with wrongdoing because that's not the way we would do it, Right? And we try and make God like us. We got to be careful of that. We are dealing with somebody who is totally other. And that's something that the disciples struggled with from time to time. I I was talking to a a woman, this was years ago, and she was saying, and she said about her relationship with with God, she said, I I don't really see God in in reverence. I don't. I, I don't reverence God. But I do see him as my friend, my very close friend. Now, she's not totally incorrect for thinking that. There's, there's, there is an intimacy in our relationship with, with God. I think God longs for that for, for us. But we have to be careful. Because at the same time, we're, you ever think, we are, we're dealing with the God of the universe. We are dealing with a God who... Think about this. Who spoke and the universe came to be. We're, not, we're dealing with somebody who's totally other. And so the danger is, is that when we, when, we, when we look solely at the, at, the, at the friendship aspect of things with our relationship with God, but really not understanding who it is we're, we're, we're totally dealing with, there's, there's this danger of pulling God down to our level. <laughs> 
Now, don't get rid of that. That's, that's important, too. It's, it's a balancing act. It's a both and. But when we take one side and we just kind of focus more on that, we tend to forget who we're dealing with. And what we do is we take God, we bring him down to our level, and, we, and unconsciously, I think, we say, God is just like us. And so, that's, and so, when, and so when, when situations come in our lives and God works, sometimes we scratch our heads and we say, why did God do it this way? Why did God do it that way? Because we, we, we fail to understand sometimes and we fail to, to reason in our own minds and, and remember that, hey, we're dealing with somebody who is, who is totally other. And our view of God can affect the way that we approach him um, and how we relate to him. So we have to be very careful of that. Now, the second question the first question is, do we know who God is? The second question is, do we know what he's done in our lives? And I'm being specific. You know, just specifically, do you, do you know what God has done or what he is doing? Now, I said before that a lot of times we, we suffer from forgetfulness. We're very forgetful people. I can tell you times in my life where I've literally forgotten what God has done five minutes ago, and what he did was truly amazing. That's a problem. <laughs> I recognize that. I've seen that in my life. And then I remember later, oh, you, you know, God. And so when we don't really have an idea of what God is doing in our lives, we, we find ourselves in the exact same cycle, cycle that the disciples were in. Because they had been in situations where they had seen God work here before, and then they forgot. And then they come back to this one situation, and they forgot. And then they, they're in the boat with Jesus. And they forgot what he did in those, past few, in, in those past couple of times. Being mindful of what God has done really does a lot of progressing ourselves forward in, 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 in our growth, in our spiritual lives. Uh, just to bring out just a quick example from Scripture, you can think about um, in Deuteronomy... Deuteronomy was written to a second generation of Israelites who were about to enter into the promised land. Now, the first generation had died. They had wandered in the wilderness. Now, what was their mistake? Their mistake was that when they came to the border of the promised land, they sent spies, and when the spies came back, they said, those people are huge, we can't defeat them. It demoralized everybody else, and they said, we can't do it. And so God says, well, you're not going in. So they said, take a walk, and they took a 40-year stroll through the wilderness until that generation died. And so when you read Deuteronomy, uh, particularly in in chapter 2 and chapter 3, it's interesting that that Moses recounts for them what the Lord was able to do in defeating large armies of people on the east side of the Jordan, not the side where he was giving them the land, on the east side. He says, remember what you did to those Amorite kings, Sion and Og, who, by the way, were giants themselves. You see the connection? He says, so if God was able to help you defeat them here, he'll be able to do the same thing on the other side. Don't make the same mistake that that the former generation had done. Remember what God has done for you. Remember David. What what did he say when he was going to to face Goliath? You know, people are saying, what is a runt like you going to do with a guy like that? There's no way. He says, well, look, as a shepherd, I, I came against lions and bears. And, uh, and, I was, and the Lord was able to give me the ability to kill them to protect the sheep. If God is able to help me to do that, then certainly he's, he's able to help me defeat this uncircumcised Philistine. Being, able, being aware of what God has done. So, here's a question, and I just want to lay this out in closing. And this is, this is I didn't plan to close like this with this question, but... It's it's because it's actually something that I thought of on the way here, and I want to and I just want to pose it to you to think in your own minds. Do we when we when we get up in the morning? Do we when we get up and we go about our day? Do we wake up with a desire and an expectation to see God work in our lives? Do we have that? And I say and listen, I deliberately say we, I. Because I, if I, someone were to ask me that question, I'd have to say, uh, you know, it, do, I, do I wake up with a desire and an expectation to see God work? And God, listen, God works all the time. And I think one of our problems is, is that we just have trouble paying attention. I'm going to say this real quick. 
It was years ago. This is just an example of, of just how God works. Um, it was years ago. I was still in seminary. And um, one of the, one of the, uh, one of the uh, assignments for one of my classes, um, this was a ministry praxis class. It was a class where you just get experience in, in ministry, just practical ministry experience. And one of my assignments was that I was supposed to interview um, somebody from a funeral home, somebody who ran a funeral home, just, you know, to get an idea of how do ministers interact with people, you know, when funerals happen and, and things like that. And um, listen, I, a short circuit up here or, or something, but, but what happened was I called, I called one funeral home that I knew of, but in my mind, I thought it was another funeral home. So I, I'm talking to the people, I'm thinking I'm talking to the people at this funeral home, but I'm actually talking to them at, at this funeral home. So you, you see where I'm, where I'm going with this. So naturally, when I, when I set up the appointment to sit down with, with whoever, I go to the place where I thought that I called. And so when I walk in and, uh, and they say, yeah, I'm here with the appointment with so-and-so, they say, there's nobody, there's nobody here by that name. Yeah, well, I had an appointment on this day at 3 o'clock, and it, I think, you had, did, did you mean the, the one down the street? Because they were on the same street, Points Avenue. There was one here, and there was one several blocks down the road. So I'm like, ah, oh, this is embarrassing. Uh, so I got in my car, and I went to the other funeral home, and I said, yeah, I have an appointment with, with so-and-so. Oh, yeah, they're back here. And so I asked the questions and, you know, got the assignment done, no problem. But this person I was talking to, this lady, she was a believer, and uh, outside of the time where I was just asking her questions, we just spent maybe a good 30 minutes just talking about the things of God. And it was wonderful. I, it, that, that time was truly encouraging. And I said, you know what, this is interesting, because when I first set this whole thing up, I thought I was setting up an appointment with the funeral home down the street, you know, at the, at the, point of, uh, at, at the corner of Point and Sunset. I thought that's, what, that's, where, I was, that's, that, that's not where I was going, but it ended up being being here. And she looked at me, she said, that's no accident. I think God just kind of brought those things together. And so, you know, I, God, set that, God set that up so that I can have an interaction with this person, so I could be tremendously, tremendously encouraged. When I wake up in the morning, not, not all situations have to look exactly like that, obviously, but a challenge for myself, and I, I would hope this would be a challenge for you, that when you wake up in the morning, that you ask yourself, how is God, how, do I, I want a desire and an expectation to see God work in some way, in some sense, in some form, to him, for him to manifest himself in my life, to see him working in my life, or maybe in the life of, uh, life of somebody else. Let's have a desire and an expectation to see God work. And so as we continue to do that, we can remember more and more. And this is where journaling comes in, which I don't do, but you see the merits of it where people have more of a, more of a, and more of a position to remember what God has done and so that, we can, so that we can relate to him better. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for how you work with us. And so, Lord, we, we understand and we acknowledge that there are times where we don't, we don't have it all together. Sometimes we're slow, just like the disciples. But one thing that I am encouraged about, Lord, when we look at scripture, is that you are patient with them and we believe that you're patient with us. And so, Lord, forgive us for those times where we, where we don't look for you, where we overlook your work in our lives, Lord, and give us that heart's desire just to be, to, to be able to see you in every step of the way in our lives, every single day. May we behold your beauty, may we behold your glory as you continue to work in our lives and in the lives of other people. And may the end result of all of that be your, your honor and your glory and your exaltation. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.